Thank you very much. Uh, good, good evening or good day or wherever, wherever you are. Um, welcome to SOAS. I, you know, I'm, I was hesitating when I, when I heard short presentation. I'm not sure how short it's going to be. Uh, but if, if there's burning questions, please, please shout, interrupt. Um, and I try to get it within, within the time scale. Um, some of you, I think we've already met at maybe early events or indeed if some of you are already here at SOAS. Uh, my name is Lutz Martin. I am um, a professor of general and African linguistics, so my interest is in African languages. I'm half in the Africa section, half in the ling linguistic section of the uh, School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Um, and I've been at SOAS for a very long time, uh, since the 1990s really. Um, so we can, you know, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, but today I have two things really. One is a general overview of the program, the MA African Studies and the department in which it is housed, which I'm going to go over quite swiftly because the main point is I want to talk about what, what sometimes is called the, the African language renaissance that is taking stock of um, recent developments in the sociology of language, language use, African languages in the African continent. And then also we can in the Q&A look a little bit at the role of language learners and the work we do here in relation to that. Um, so the uh, background on the program, Allah, don't let me do it. Yes, now I'm good. Um, this is the SOAS highlights. I, I, as I said, I won't dwell much. You're probably familiar with it. It's a great institution, focused on Africa and Asia, really strong research, a strong library, um, very diverse, very international. Um, um, this is SLCL, the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Within, within the SOAS background, the languages we teach, there are six languages. We usually teach Amharic, Hausa, Somali, Swahili, Yoruba, and Zulu. Um, and we also focus on literatures, cultures, linguistics, and translations. Um, this is about studying Africa. So these are just some you know, talking points, if you like, starters of discussion about things which come up again when, when we um, engage with students in the MA African Studies, which I think is probably the main program we're talking about here. But again, we can come back to that in the Q&A. There's questions of diversity and unity. To what extent is the continent? You know, it, can we talk about Africa? What does that mean? There's diversity within, but there's also a sense of unity. Um, of unity. Um, there is the, the question of, of you know, ancient history, the, the home, home of humanity, if you like, uh, but also very high, high um, youth demographics. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, of course, colonial legacies and decolonization are really important in the source context at the moment as well. So that's something which really features quite, quite prominently in, I think probably all of the modules we are, we are um, offering. Um, there's questions of complexity and perspectivity, which links to that as well. Orientalism, orientalizing um, um, is, 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 are some of the terms which come up there. Um, there's an interesting relation between town and country and urbanization and, and the effects that has in many different ways in politics and economics and education and culture, of course. Um, and then also the question of position and center and margins and where, where we see ourselves. So the, the, our new director, Adam Habib, who you may have come across in many different contexts in the last couple of days, um, but he talks about that, that rather than we are looking towards the global south, we should be thinking of global problems through the lens of Africa and Asia. So that's a question of perspective and where do you stand and where do you sit yourself, yourselves or ourselves. Um, and that's something which, which, um, which feeds into the module as well. Um, this is an outline of the MA African Studies. This we can come back to, I won't, I won't dwell on that. And I think the information should be available elsewhere. Um, these are some examples of um, modules which are part of the, of the program. As you can see, there's, it goes from literature, uh, from um, music, politics, law. It's a wide range of interdisciplinary courses from which, which you can build your own program. Um, this says, thank you, please ask any questions. You're welcome to ask questions, um, but we can um, probably do that in the Q&A. Um, let me reduce a little bit. Yes, um, <clears throat> unless there's something really burning. Um, if there isn't anything burning, I'm going to um, continue um, and go to the, you know, if you like, the main title of, of this um, afternoon's presentation, the African Languages Renaissance. Um, so what I have in mind with that is I want to look briefly at African languages as a background, um, then look at colonial um, histories of devalorization, that is marginalization, and and give, giving less value, if you like, to African languages. So that links back to the discussion we had earlier about, about uh, decolonizing. Um, and then this phenomenon of the language renaissance, which is, which is a question over the last 20, 30 years, and then come to a little summary at the end. Um, this is um, a summary of the world's languages 
and there are about 7,000 languages in the world. About 30% of these languages are spoken in Africa. Um, so you know, the, the number I have here is 2,110. It is very difficult to count languages. And also you see that's 2009, it's changed a little bit. So you know, we, we have to take this with a bit of, you know, with a grain of salt, if you like. Um, but but as, a, as a general tendency, I think that's about correct. So Africa is linguistically very diverse and very rich. Um, if we look at the, at the physical map, so this is map of the world. And again, we talk, can talk about actually what maps mean and geographic representations mean. Um, but what I want to show here is that the, all the little orange dots are, are a language. So you can see there's a clustering of orange dots um, actually around the equator globally, uh, but in the African context in particular, high density of languages spoken in West Africa, Nigeria, that comes out very, very clearly, but across, across the continent also in Kenya and Tanzania, um, in Ethiopia, in the South, and then less density, but still quite quite significant number of languages further south and further further north to that. Um, there's there's quite a bit we can say about the structural diversity. So I don't have much to say about this at the moment. But if you have questions, I'm happy to engage. Um, so there's there's lots of interesting things we can say about consonants. That is particular speech speech speech, speech sounds. Um, tone in a, another element of of speech sounds in West Africa. You know. Um, Yoruba and Hausa are famous tone languages, for example. <clears throat> the nominal classification, the way languages classify nouns, like noun classes and Bantu languages, are very famous for that, like in Swahili. Um, the way languages conceptualize temporal distinction, terms aspect marking, information structure. This is how, how in, in interaction speakers and hearers structure the contributions to highlight certain things. And then word order is another element linguists look at. And this is a, a research project we are currently running comparing Bantu languages in the southern half of the continent. Um, and there we see that each color dot is a different form of noun classification. Again, we don't, you know, we don't have to look at the details, but it's this some of the strands of work we do at SOAS and which are important across, across the field of African languages linguistics. Um, this is just an indication of important language of wider communication. There is, you know, this, this is slightly intuitive, but you can see um, that the big languages are from Arabic in the north, and then we have uh, Wall of Yoruba, Ibo in the West. Uh, Somali is big as well in the Horn of Africa. Swahili, of course, is the biggest African language in terms of overall number of speakers. And in the South, we have Zulu and also Afrikaans, um, the uh, Germanic language arising more historically related to, to Dutch. Um, and again, we can argue and think about what does it mean to be an African language? Actually, we could think about what does it mean to be a language? Uh, but I, you know, for the time being, I just take that as, as assumed. Um, a bit of historical background, um, African languages have sustained and supported the cultural, social, and economic activities of the continent for millennia. There's obviously a long history of languages um, in the continent. Um, and the study of language can help us to understand the history of the people in the society speaking them. Um, and we know that in the course of the history, African languages have been associated with or, or, or sustained, if you like, uh, for example, periods of expansion where languages and, and with that cultural practices traveled. Um, established polities like you know, states, empires, kingdoms, cities, um, but also importantly patterns of multilingualism, which is really important in the African context and, and elsewhere, but, but certainly in Africa. Um, this is a map of African language families. It's a metaphor, hence the square, square quotes, um, but it gives an idea how different languages are related, and that, that is quite interesting um, to study history and prehistory, like long durée history, about six, seven thousand years, ten thousand years, maybe even, um, and and try to understand what happened, what is the social history, the cultural history, how did people interact and relate to each other, um, and if we go a bit closer to time, so this is an hypothesis people have made made about the, the spread of Bantu languages um, originating from from Nigeria, Cameroon, and then spreading eastwards and southwards to the present distribution. Um, and then people ask whether it's the language is spreading or the speaker moving or a combination of both. Uh, so that takes us about 2000 years uh, before present. Um, and here's another map representation. This is 15th and 16th century. Um, so there, there we can see more diversity in the historical record. Um, and we can see different state formation happening with the, the Hausa states in the Northwest um, associated with Hausa, but also with Fulani. If you look at the right-hand side map, the little uh, darker arrows in West Africa, that's that's Fulani speakers. So you can see the language is widely distributed across a whole belt in West Africa. Um, and then if you, in both maps, actually, if you go on the East Coast, the, on in the left-hand side map, 
the little black dogs, these are Swahili trading towns. So we know that Swahili spread through um, um, urban, urban trade routes driven by the monsoon trade. So there's a link also to the Arabian Peninsula all the way up to India. Um, we think of the, the ocean as connecting rather than dividing. And there's also a link, if you go further south, there's, there's the circle with Zimbabwe. Um, that's great, Zimbabwe, big, big gold, uh, gold trading um, polity and economy. Um, and that was linked to that trade as well. And you can see this is cultural history, but language often helps to get a clearer understanding um, of, of what happened. Um, and then the final slide I have on this is Swahili literature. So we have um, records of, of African languages. Um, and this is um, the, you know, the, the record itself. This is, this is 20th century, I think, or 19th. Um, the text is most certainly older. It's a very famous poem, the al Shafi. it's but sometimes translated as the soul's awakening, uh, where the poet laments the downfall of the traditional Swahili culture, even in the 19th century, and which, which the downfall of culture was, was portrayed very vividly as almost like painful, as like physical pain and, and even death. Um, so there's, there's lots of cultural stuff in there. So the Swahili manuscript, this is actually housed in Soas, and we have quite a number of Swahili manuscripts and a rich, rich resource for studying, you can see it's written in Arabic script. It's not Arabic, it's just the script being used for writing Swahili, Ajami sometimes it's called. Um, and so this is a really interesting field of study which you know, we and other people pursue. Um, let us move to the colonial background. In the colonial times, we had marginalization, devaluation, underdevelopment of African languages. We had the rise of negative attitudes, the introduction of colonial languages into the linguistic environment. Uh, political colonial agendas, of course, language ideologies, negative often, um, language invention and linguistic essentialism, we can come back to that essentially, essentially reducing people to one homogeneous group and, and labeling them often with a linguistic label. Um, and also there was a link to pedagogy and politics. Um, I have a bit more on the, on the pedagogy. This is a French language policy, education policy in Senegal from the 1920s. Uh, the fundamental problem in the education system in, in Senegal um, is the use of the native language, a spoken but unwritten language, as the means of attaining the teaching of pupils. So lots of things are wrong here. Uh, African languages are seen as a problem, and they are, they are seen, seen as less valued because they are unwritten, which is actually perhaps not true, because there's lots of Ajami writing, as we've just seen. Um, but also the sentiment is problematic because there's nothing wrong with the spoken language. Um, so you can see here colonial prejudices um, seeping into um, the education discourse. Um, this, is British, this is British policy in Tanzania, again from the 20s. Um, and there, the, the guidance there was that the tribal language, so the thing in tribes already again is problematic, um, should be used in the lower elementary standards or grades, a lingua franca of African origin, Swahili in most cases in East Africa, should be introduced in the middle classes of the school if the area is occupied by large native, native groups speaking diverse languages. Um, and the language of the European nation control should be taught in the upper standard. So there's a very clear sense that natives are not as good as Europeans, Europeans are in control. Um, but there's also hierarchy of languages. In community languages are lowest, then the lingua franca, the language of wider communication in the middle, and the European language on top. And this hierarchical thinking got reinforced in all kinds of different um, policy documents in both language and cultural policy. Um, and then South Africa, of course, we know that was that suffered tremendously, not only under colonialism, but also specifically under apartheid, um, which is the, the segregationist colonial racist uh, policy which obtained from the 1940s to the 1990s. So the Education Act of 50, 53 says that natives must be taught from an early age that equality with Europeans is not for them. There's no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of a certain forms of labor. So we know apartheid was this really, really divisive and, and suppressive, oppressive, and that then also fell into the education system. There was a very famous uprising in 76. Some of you may have heard about that. I, I, I can't quite remember it actively, but to me, it was very vivid. When I grew up, this was really important. Um, and that was about language in 1974. The apartheid government required black schools to use Afrikaans and English, and the students objected to the use of Afrikaans. They thought that's regressive, that's associated with apartheid, and um, they wanted English, which is in another sense problematic. We come back to that. Um, but so in, in June 76, there was high school protest across this country, starting in Soweto in, in Johannesburg. Um, and the police was very unprepared, had a very, very strong heavy-handed response and 176 students died, all of them obviously unarmed young people, 
Um, so it was a real, really traumatic moment in, in South African history. And in some sense, a turning point, you know, this was the beginning of like, if it wasn't, then that was the last straw of apartheid. And in, in a sense, the beginning of the downfall of apartheid, which took another 20 years to come to fruition. Uh, but but this, I think that that was really important in the national psyche. And for us, it's important here that this is about language. Um, now let us fast forward and look um, at the present day and the, the African language Renaissance. I, I, I'm happy to ask you later whether you think that's an overstatement with the Renaissance. Um, so during the colonial period, African language experienced marginalization, suppression, negative attitudes. We've just seen that. After independence, many African countries adopted a one language policy, often promoting English or French. So that was the link between the Soweto uprising and the demand for English rather than Isisulu, which could have been also on the agenda. Um, so English and French remain quite dominant, but then in the 21st century, we have seen the onset of what sometimes you can call an African language renaissance. Um, that is the recognition of African language and public policy, the development of multilingual policy in education and public discourse, and the birth of new linguistic varieties such as Sheng, Pidgin, or translanguaging practices. Um, so here are some language policies in the 21st century. Um, South Africa, the 1996 constitution, very multilingual. I, I think I have a slide about that just now. Um, Cameroon language and education project to, to recognize the multilingual nature. Um, Ethiopian federalism also meant that, so in Ethiopia, Amharic was, was the main language really for a very, very long time. But the more federalist um, policy meant that uh, other languages also had public recognition. Um, in Uganda, the main area languages act allowed the use of, of African language and education. Even Tanzania, which has a very modern Swahili policy in 2015 um, modified that a little bit. Um, we have minority and endangered languages activism. That's really important. There's lots of endangered languages in the world, and that also has brought languages to the fore. We have education and literacy programs, um, also in African languages. Speech and language technology, um, NLP is natural language processing, and automatic translation for African languages has become important, also in the context of mobile phone technology. And in many ways, if, if, you, know, if you traveled recently in Africa, context, contacts in Africa, uh, mobile phone technology is almost leapfrogging stuff here. So like electronic payment is much more advanced in many African contexts than, than in this country, I think. Um, and we also have the African Academy of Languages, which is a branch of the um, AU, the African Union, uh, specifically promoting languages. There's lots of elements coming up. Um, this is um, African official national languages, sometimes a bit difficult to find, but I just want to highlight here, all the yellow ones are, um, are countries uh, which have an African language as natural language on the left-hand side, so the country column, and the language column on the right-hand side, respectively, these are the African languages, and I haven't brought an earlier shot, but if you go back 30 years, say, there's many, much fewer African languages in the picture. So there's really been an, an, an increase in the recognition of African languages at a very high national level. Um, so this is a South African ex uh, example. I noticed that the post-apartheid 1996 constitution, the official languages of the Republic are Sepedi, Sisutu, Siswana, Siswati, Chibenda, Chitonga, Afrikaans, English, Isindebele, Isiklausa, and Isizulu. So you have here 11 national languages and actually uh, South African sign language was added later. Um, and the reason for that is recognizing the historically diminished use and status of the indigenous languages of our people. The state must take practical and positive measures to elevate the status and advance the use of these languages. So there's real political impetus to revalorize, if you like, African languages. Um, this is just a snapshot of Swahili, how that works out. This is, I've, I've taken that from a different presentation that's it's a bilingual. Um, so there's Swahili on the slide as well. Um, but we see here on the left-hand side, the Lurayeto, Fahariyeto, our language, our pride. You can see the link between language and national identity. The uh, middle one, Pata Chapa, around the corner, it's a multilingual sign from Nairobi, uh, which uses Sheng, I come back to Sheng. The top right-hand side is just bilingual signage, again in Nairobi. And on the bottom right-hand side, it's the annual meeting of the Swahili Society, or you know, Swahili, you know, let's say, society um, of, of Kenya. Um, and then you can just see this is illustrated scholarship in Swahili. So there's, you know, there, there's a real impetus here as well in East Africa. Um, this is Swahili being taught in different countries of the world, and there might well be more, but you can see there's quite an international community of language learners of Swahili. Um, um, the pre-final one I want to talk about, youth languages a little bit, because that's another interesting dynamics playing out at the moment. Um, African urban youth languages, sometimes called AU, AUYLs, uh, are in-group languages, and their speakers are typically young youth, hence youth language. Um, structurally, AUYLs, AUYLs, 
African new languages, are characterized by innovation and in particular by manipulation of linguistic forms, which are consciously changed and altered. So I don't have examples here, but I'm happy to, to take that up in the Q&A. Um, by undermining and subverting standard varieties, they can be seen at questioning social power relations through language. So that's the social element of it. Uh, and the prevalence of African youth languages in the African linguistic context may be related to the strong youth demographics in many African countries and the sense of relative disenfranchisement of these groups. So many African leaders are quite established, old even. So if you look at, at Uganda, for example, the, the power structures haven't changed that very much. Um, but, but, the, but many, many African countries have a very, very high number of young people. Um, and this relation may well account for the need maybe or the desire or just the, the it so happens that the, the form of expression becomes prominent, which then gets picked up as youth languages. So examples are Sheng, very famous maybe in Kenya, originating in Nairobi, based on Swahili, English, and other Kenyan languages. And actually Sheng speakers are no longer young anymore necessarily. So Sheng has really gone, gone out of this in-group language status to a much wider language form in Kenya. There's Sepitor in South Africa, Tsotsital in South Africa as well. That's probably the oldest attested one. Tsotsi is an old word for gangster. So again, you can see it comes historically from a marginalized group of people, but then, then gets wider. Uh, Luyaya in Uganda and Nuchi also quite famous in, in West Africa and Cote d'Ivoire, um, which has been elevated quite, quite swiftly um, to very high status in the context of, of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, these are just little examples on the left hand side. It's a ghetto FM, a radio station and the official Sheng station as it were. And you can see the voice of the youth um, and home of urban music in, in Kenya. And on the right hand side, a former colleague of ours who has just moved to Kenyatta University in Nairobi, um, writing on Sheng, the rise of a Kenyan Swahili vernacular. Um, and the final thing I want to talk about is African Englishes, because there's been a long tension between African languages and English, and that, that continues. Uh, but there's something interesting happening in that sphere as well. So we have colonial legacies, of course. English was introduced in colonial times. There's global English as an international language. Uh, the role of English in education is important in this context. Um, there is an element of, of elite closure sometimes. So the access to ex-colonial languages like English um, often is linked to the formation of elites, the language and exclusion. The famous Nigerian linguist Ayi Bambosh writes quite extensively about that and other voices across the continent have, have uh, mirrored that. Um, the speaker attitude is when English is seen as modern, as given access to good jobs. Um, sometimes they are seen as neutral in, in, a, in a maybe non-social way, but in an ethnic way or cultural way. Um, and the interesting thing I'm after really is the appropriation of English. That is, there's, we now talk about South African English, Nigerian English, where English has, has taken root, if you like, um, in African contexts. Um, so one, one famous proponent here is that's old, that's the 60s, Chino Achebe, you may have come across that. Uh, the price a world language like English must be prepared to pay is submission to many kinds of use. The African writer should aim to use English in a way that brings out his message best without altering the language to the extent that its value as a medium of international exchange will be lost. So it's a balancing act. Um, he should aim, he, he should aim at fashioning out an English, which is at once universal and able to carry his peculiar experience, but it will have to be a new English, still in full communion with its ancestral home, but altered to suit its new African surroundings. So this is the 1960s and now fast forward and the he turns into she. This is uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie who in 2020, actually earlier than that, I think 2019, she became a, a SOAS honor professor. So she is part of our community. But she says in an interview with the Oxford English Dictionary uh, that my English speaking is rooted in a Nigerian experience, not in a British, or American, or Australian one. I have taken ownership of English and I'm really interested in this notion of ownership, which changes the ballpark a little bit. So the, the, the talk of ex-colonial languages slightly becomes less, less relevant maybe in the context of modern, modern English users on the continent who are much more assertive about their relation to the language. Um, so this is just little examples. So there are different varieties of English. So are these different Englishes? That's a long discussion people have. Are there lexical differences, different words? And the answer is yes. Phonological differences, accents, yes. There's a the question of standard and orthography development. And of course, it's, ultimately, it's about social linguistic power. Um, and the examples I hear is on the, on the left, it's Aish, is it English? That's South Africa. Uh, by, by a colleague of ours, Raj Meshri wrote about that. Uh, the middle one, that's the new BBC, newish BBC um, World Service News in Pidgin. So this is now in a different spelling. If, you, if you're a Pidgin speaker, you can read it. If an English speaker, you have to look twice. 
Um, and on the right hand side, um, a, a work by Alfred Bourguea from Nairobi University, actually not Kenyatta, on Kenyan English. So, so there's interesting things also happen in that sphere. Um, so to summarize, African languages have been strengthened over the first two decades of the new millennium. Um, across the continent and globally, African languages are valued as important tools of communication, identity and empowerment. Um, at the same time, the pervasiveness and potential of multilingual practices, practices have been recognized um, in communities and in the classroom. I haven't spoken much about education, but the use of different languages in the classroom is something which is also coming much to the fore at the moment. Um, and then finally, teaching and learning of African languages, as we do here, um, as well as research and scholarship, in, scholarship increases knowledge and empowers students. So that's a bit of a sales pitch, I'm afraid, but, but you know, there's other things we can, we can draw from that. Um, and with that, this is just a, a summary slide and a visual impression. We have the, the pigeon. Um, the bottom left is that's the Akalan, the African Academy of, Academy of Languages, uh, dedicated to the promotion of African languages. Sheng, we've seen on the right hand side, the final greeting, if you like, Neville Alexander, uh, a linguist and language activist from South Africa, um, who was very, very vocal in promoting multilingual education. He also was, he was um, an ANC member and supporter. He served time in Robben Island. Um, and he passed away in 2012, sadly, much bemoaned by many, a very, very positive, active, you know, creative thinker um, and advocate for African languages. Um, and with that, we close with the picture of Nairobi because we talked a lot about Kenya as well. Um, thank you very much for that. I think I'm done with my presentation um, and I'm happy to take some questions. So again, if anybody would have any questions either about our programs, about um, the content um, in terms of what you might study, uh, SOAS in general, um, then please do feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. Um, I can see that we haven't had any questions in yet, but do feel free to ask anything you would like. And then maybe I can also introduce um, Alice to you who's in the session today. Um, who is one of our um, current students. So maybe Alice, you can just give a quick overview of who you are and your time at SOAS um, and your studies that you've had so far. Sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Alice. Um, I'm a third year BA African student. So not a master's student like you are probably interested in, but still um, I've had some experience um, studying some of the languages. So I studied Amharic and Swahili and, uh, and still currently think Swahili. Um, what can I say? <laughs> um, so I'm originally from London, but I have experience living um, both in student accommodation and um, in my family in London. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them to me in the chat as well. What would you say drew you to studying at SOAS in terms of the, the subject area? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's, it's one of the only places in the UK that does African studies and uh, um, it's, it's well known for that. So when I, when I did come to SOAS, I um, started doing research for essays and assignments that I had. Um, all of the research I was doing happened to be written by like ex SOAS students or ex SOAS researchers and things like that. So it's like, that is like the center of African studies in the UK. Um, and also I chose it um, really for the languages. Um, so I really wanted to continue studying Amharic and um, there's not many places in the UK that teach Amharic. Um, so I really wanted to come to us to learn Amharic and then Swahili was part of my course. Um, and I really enjoyed learning Swahili and I'm now currently in Kenya, still trying slowly to improve my Swahili. Um, and the Swahili teacher, Ida, uh, so as is amazing would definitely recommend her um just like very passionate as is Lute, about like sharing the culture and the language um really wanting you to get them like the best of your experience at so us yeah and i think i mean that's one of the really interesting parts i think because you don't just learn the language itself uh, and how um how it's made up really you you actually learn about the cultural aspect of it and you learn about um, the culture and the people over time and, and again how that um, adapts within the language itself and the, the historical content of it and I think looks like much of what you went through in terms of um, looking at the languages of Africa which uh, you know in themselves are 
are very diverse and, and huge. Um, there's a lot of change that's happened over time and influences that have, have come in. So I think that's a really interesting part of it. So again, if anybody's got any questions and they would like to know more about those areas, please do feel, feel free to put them into the chat. But even if it's just about the general experience at SOAS, please feel free to drop anything into the Q&A box. And that's just at the bottom of your screens. If you hover, hover over the bottom of the screens, you'll see that the Q&A box in there for you to drop any questions in that you'd like. I know it's always hard to be that first person to drop a question in there, so. <laughs> um, I'm, also, I'm also happy to talk more about the program structure if people are more interested in that. I wasn't quite sure because this, this is the second, second open evening as it were we are running. So I wasn't quite sure how much how much background you have on the program structure, but actually I, I'm not quite sure how much there is on the web because we just revamped that quite a bit. So I, I think for the better, actually, it used to be very, very unstructured. So essentially do whatever you like, which is nice, but it's also you, you've left a bit like, mm, what does that mean? Whereas now we have, we have slightly more structure, it's still very flexible, but we have slightly more structure that we say, you know, these are the modules you have to take, and these are the options, this is how it works together, which I think, so we are running it for the first time next year, so, so you guys, if you're coming for it, you will be the first generation, which is nice because you can shape it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and then also feedback, but I, I think it's probably better than, than the previous very unstructured approach we have. Yeah, I mean, Lutz, if you'd like to go into more detail on the structure, um, please do feel free. I think that might also bring up some additional questions. Um, I can see one question has been popped into the chat, uh, which comes from Elizabeth and says, what are the benefits of studying African studies? Hmm. Ah, plenty. <laughs> um, I think so. So it depends a little bit on the background. I think many, many of our students come from maybe like degrees like history or modern languages or politics, a, a wide range. But what most of them share is that in the course of their undergraduate studies, they discovered that they're really interested in Africa. And that, that was part of Africa and all the modules. So if you do music, for example, you do like, you know, Bach and Brahms and, and, and Handel, but you also do a little bit of African music. But then, but then people felt, I want to focus on that. And then they come to the MA African studies because it, you know, it's the regional focus, which is, um, which is at the fore, if you like. Um, in, in terms of program structure, it's very interdisciplinary. So it takes you outside of disciplinary thinking and you're allowed and you know, able, encouraged even to combine different modules um, from both, both arts and humanities and social sciences. Um, and I think, you know, so, so, so that is important. I think so the academic benefit, I think it, it really pushes you to think almost outside of the box, to engage with the geog geographical region and look at that from so many different perspectives. I think that is probably the biggest challenge, but also the biggest advantage. So that's the, you know, the, the academic benefit. The more, you know, the, the career professional benefit is, I think any, any, any job or professional context which has African interest is, is a potential job market. So that, you know, be it in, in journalism and in, in politics and economics, you know, the city, um, of course, of course, you know, thinking of moving to Africa and working there. That's, that's many, many of our students is that's one of the, at least a potential career option. Um, and I think we probably have on the website little, you know, little, little examples of students' tra tra trajectories, what happened afterwards and where they are now. Um, I think a lot of our students go to Africa for at least a period um, and, then, and then get experience there and then, then might come back. Um, I, can, I can share a few like. Yeah. And I think that one of the other aspects that you've kind of touched on is that in terms of your previous studies, so say you have studied economics or politics or development studies um, or business or history or any of these areas, um, you can then go into an African studies um, program, which looks at all of those areas, but in one particular region. And it's a region that you know, has a huge amount of history and change and development still happening um, at this point. And also, if you think about um, topics such as migration and diaspora, um, well, you know, it, it brings Africa really into kind of the forefront in terms of that. So I think it's, it's about kind of looking at your previous studies and then what you might want to go into further and, and how different regions of the world are kind of all, they're all important at the same time, but what they can then bring to you in terms of, of how it will change and how it has changed over the last 100, 200, 300 years and over the next 100, 200, 300 years. Mm. 
And and also, I think what you just mentioned, Kim, with the, with the diaspora, that's really important as well. So I sort of, I, I didn't want to go into too much, but I hinted that, you know, that you can question the validity of geography. This is just this one representation of reality, which is based on land and water, if you like. But there's many different other ways of representing this. So, so African studies in a, you know, in, a, in a less geographic sense, of course, relates to African cultures and languages globally. And there's, there's a huge diaspora communities in London, in the UK, in all parts of the world. There's, you know, there's Africa-China relations, there's South-South, so the, the, the Brazil in particular, but all, all South, South America and Africa connections. And that all comes into African studies. It's, you know, it's, I mean, the, the, very, the very notion is very contested in a sense. Um, and and you know everybody can sort of give it their own content and their own their own interest, um, but there is a, there's a real global element to it as well. Um, so before I, I share my screen, yes, we're good with time. Um, there is a question by Amelia about for the final dissertation is field for compulsory, um, COVID dependent. Yes, well that's the other that's the other problem. Or desk based research dissertation more common. I think so. It's a one year master's program, and that puts certain limitations on field work. Um, so, so, you know, you, so the beginning is very packed. It's, it's co you know, coursework modules from October to December, and then it's a little bit of a Christmas break, and then from, from January to March, effectively. Then there's a month of Easter break. That in, in potentially, that's the time where you can go on field work. Um, and then term three starts, which, which there's no active teaching, but it is quite busy. There's talks, there's events, there's workshops, there's still homework to be done, and then it's starting thinking about the dissertation. Um, but in principle, that's another time to go. And then it's the writing up time, which essentially it's sort of August, September, where you don't particularly have to be in London, I don't think. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what the regulations are, but let's say you don't have to be. Um, but, uh, but you can write there, but, but that's, you know, that's writing, not field work. So I think most dissertations are, are research, you know, library desk-based. Um, maybe with a small empirical component. But of course, COVID has changed it in two ways. One, all our PhD students are deeply frustrated at the moment because they can't do field work. But the, but the silver lining, if you like, is that we have huge discussions at the moment about how to mitigate that. Because it's not just PhD students, it's, it's all of us. So I, I was supposed to be in Kenya last summer for field work. I didn't go, I still haven't been. I have, I have a project sitting there, collaborators sitting there, funding sitting there. But I, every time I ask, can we extend it because I can't travel? But so, so then the question becomes, what is the way around it? And then so people are much more, much more familiar now with remote researching. So, so using Zoom, for example, now is very common, which like two years ago, very few people knew about Zoom. Um, so Skype, that was the thing we used to use, but that's quite clunky nowadays when you look at it. But, but so this has become more common. So there is a way that, that sort of empirical, empirical work, first original data research, you know, can, can be done and inform in, in the thesis. And then the question becomes to what extent that becomes fieldwork. Is fieldwork, does fieldwork require traveling to a place and doing work? Or is fieldwork also staying where you are, but interacting with, you know, you know pe people in Nigeria, for example, if you're interested in Yoruba identities. So you, you line up people and do interviews via, via Zoom and maybe work with a collaborator there, and you have a joint project and you have group discussions. And then the question is, you know, to what extent is that fieldwork? So it gets quite, quite blurred in a sense. Um, but, but I think part of the constraints are that it's a one-year master's, unless you do it part-time, that gives you more time and more space for these sort of things. But if it's a, it's a full-time program, it's one year, it's, it's, it's not easy to get field work time in there. Um, and at the moment with COVID, of course, that's hard. And even the post-COVID reality, it's not entirely clear what that means for traveling. Because the other effect, of course, is environment. So once we're over COVID, there's, there's climate change. Um, and that influences the traveling as well. Um, ah, sorry, can I just take the next, next question? Yeah. Good. For students interested in Asian African diasporas, how do we balance courses in multiple departments? Um, two, two answers, I think. So that in anthropology, um, certainly anthropology, there, there is modules about, specifically about diaspora studies. And there is, there's a SOA center for, I think it's called Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies. Yeah. Um, so, there's, so the research is there, the expertise is there. To what extent are dedicated modules that we have to check and we can check on the website. Um, but quite in general, actually, so, so mod taught modules are all, only always like stepping stones or scaffolding, if you like, for you to fashion your own interests. So these are just things to start a discussion to provide entry points. But if you're interested in diaspora things, then any module I should think will be able to allow that. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm teaching a module which is related to what I just talked about called uh, language identity in society in Africa. 
but my understanding of Africa is, is you know quite complex and fluid, if you like. So it's and, and actually we had to we had a session we had, we had you know we had a guest section for session somebody in Nigeria, somebody in London, both work on Europe diaspora. So that and we had diaspora students in the class. Um, so then students wrote essays on diaspora topic and that become entirely consistent with the course content. So it was nothing nothing unusual. So that I would imagine works for all 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 modules. Um, but I take this opportunity. If I may, to share. Yeah, to I'd just um, add to that yeah. that so you are able to take um, some of the modules from the migration and diaspora um, program that we have. So you, those would be on the open module list, but also you are allowed to audit some additional modules. My only caveat with that would be that always think about what you're doing in terms of your program and whether you have the time to add in a whole other additional module. So when you audit modules, you don't necessarily do the assessments for them, but you do mm. go to the lectures and sometimes the seminars. And it's always just important to factor in that time. Um, but there's lots of open lectures that happen at SOAS as well. Um, at the moment, we're running a seminar series um, for the Migration Center for Migration and Diaspora, which is open to everybody. So there'll be lots of different things that you can do at SOAS, both in the classroom environment and outside of it to build up that knowledge on various different areas like migration and diaspora and kind of then bring that into your program in your own way. Mm, absolutely. I think part of the problem with studying here actually is that there's just so much. I mean, it's wonderful because it's so rich, but you know, for my for my interest, I could go, I mean, now with COVID it's different, but even then, but in like before COVID, I, I could go to a SOAS event almost every evening. There was almost something, a lecture or a guest speaker, speaker or workshop. At least once a week, I would I would try to manage, and even that's hard. And that's complete. That's on top of like you know the normal modules. Um, so there is lots of things to to inspire, I should think. Um, but but uh, you know, just looking at the slide I have up here, so these are examples of modules, and I can't at, at the moment I can't quite guarantee that they run next year because I think we haven't quite done that yet. But it should be fairly soon that we have a, a more or less definite list of things which are running. But these are modules which are part of the MA African Studies. And you can see, so there's politics of Africa, political life in African cities, and African feminism. And that, I mean, you know, I mean, maybe the first to our African force, African feminism, I, I, I can guarantee you that, that that has a wider view of Africa, where diaspora thinking certainly will come in there. Um, Atlantic music, players of mediation of African popular music, that looks very much at, at Cuban music as well as at Latin American music um, and, and North American music for that matter. Um, modern contemporary arts, the language identity society I talked about. Contemporary African literature, African literature again has, is a similar fluid notion of what counts as African literature, but again, diaspora literature certainly would be in there. Um, economic development there, you know, that, that's, you know, the, the da basic data will come from Africa, I'd imagine. African philosophy again combines that. And then what made me think of it was this African and Asian diaspora in, in the contemporary world. Um, so this is, this is, you know, this is an ex you know, a model explicitly in the title, including the, the diaspora and the thinking across, across both Africa and Asia actually, and diaspora communities. And then finally law and post-colonial theory, again, that will, that will be informed by wider global thinking. Um, so I think diaspora really, it's, it's a very important element of this discourse and will come up in so many different ways in modules, in, in seminars and in talks, in your own work, in the dissertation. Um, and and that's, it's both common and welcome. And there's lots of expertise, I think, in the building. OK, I'll just see if we have any final questions coming through. Um, doesn't look like we have any for the moment. So um, thank you all for joining us. We will be wrapping up the session um, about now as well. So I um, hope that's been helpful for you. Uh, do feel free to join us at any follow-up sessions that we have. Do you feel free to um, reach out if you have any questions? Um, so uh, through our website, um, I'll also put my um, email address um, in the chat box for you. And so if you do have any follow-up questions, do feel free to um, contact me with those. And do go onto the website. We have lots of events coming up over the next couple of weeks and months um, that may interest you. Some are taster sessions, so you can actually um, listen to um, a lecture or two. And if you haven't already been to our events page, there are already um, a number of taster sessions um, registered up there. So thank you all again for taking the time to come. Thank you very much, um, Lips, for uh, the presentation. And thank you very much, Alice, for giving us a student's view.
Um, and we wish you all a good evening or a good day um, or a good night, depending on where you are. <laughs> and um, look forward to interacting with you more um, over the next few months. And also if you join us um, in SOAS uh, for your studies.